Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is on the book of Isaiah, and much of that is about Isaiah himself. This is lesson number six in that series. It's for February 6 of 2021, and the title is a very interesting one, Playing God. Playing God? How could that happen? Well, let's begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father, we, we bow before you right now, seeking to have a better understanding of what was going on back in the days of Isaiah, and as you worked with him in that very difficult situation, very threatening situation, where every, any day they never knew when they went to bed at night that they would be alive to wake up in the morning. Lord, we're thankful, we're so thankful that we don't live under those conditions at this moment. We know that terrible times are coming for, ahead for the, your, your faithful people. So may we look forward to that, if it's your will, and may we live through it. And look forward to your second coming is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This lesson, just to give you a heads up, will cover chapters 13 and 14 of Isaiah and also chapters 24 to 27. And this lesson will skip over a large part of the book of Isaiah, between Isaiah 14 and 24, and those chapters cover, cover God's predictions regarding the futures of a group of pagan and idolatrous nations surrounding Judah and Jerusalem. So this lesson will review a lot of ancient history and help us to understand some of the reasons why God blessed certain groups and why he allowed other groups to go into oblivion, and many of them did. <laughs> Pride and sin began in the heart of a mighty angel in heaven as he was standing next to the throne of God. It's hard to imagine that. He began to think proud and rebellious thoughts which eventually led to the great controversy and will lead to the destruction of millions of people in our world. Our only safety is in turning away from following Lucifer, Satan, to following Jesus Christ. He died for us and died to show us a stark contrast between evil with its results and good with its results. In Isaiah's day, the big bully nation was Assyria. We started the book of Isaiah noting that King Ahaz of Judah appealed to Tiglath-Pileser III of Assyria to get him to attack Syria and northern kingdom of Israel, which were his cousins, so that they would stop attacking Judah. So, I mean, I, that's hard for me to even wrap my mind around. Yeah. Sometime later in Isaiah 13, <clears throat> Isaiah began to write about Babylon. While we have no way of, to date the writing of Isaiah 13 exactly, it is very likely that this followed the experience of Hezekiah with the Babylonian emissaries as recorded in 2 Kings 20. And we'll talk more about that later. But uh, we need to keep in mind that Isaiah was probably born around 720, 725, 730 B.C. and lived down to maybe even as early as 740 B.C. and lived down to about 680 or remember we're counting down, yeah. uh, maybe even a little while beyond that. So he lived about 50 or so. 60 years. Six and how did he die? They sought him. Manasseh, that awful, awful, awful king, put him in a hollow log. There's an apocryphal text that says that Isaiah actually tried to hide in the, follow, in the hollow log. It was a standing up hollow log, but a little part of his, of his robe was hanging out the bottom. That's how they saw him. And then they sawed him in half. Okay, uh, at that time Babylon was a far-off nation with little power, but with his ability to see the future, God revealed that Babylon would one day be the superpower and a terrible threat to the people of Judah. Judah would howl in pain, and you can read about that in Isaiah 13. We're going to just touch a couple points out of Isaiah 13. Isaiah made some startling statements in Isaiah 13. Isaiah 13:10 Every star and every constellation will stop shining 
The sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will give no light. American Bible Society, the Holy Bible, Good News Translation. Okay, so who's in charge of that kind of stuff? God. Do we have the ability to turn the sun on or off or the stars? We have no power, all those things whatsoever. So no human power could have that effect on heavenly bodies. This should remind us that God is the one who is in charge and can use even the heavenly bodies as signs of what he's planning to do. Remember what happened with the story of Hezekiah? The sundial was moved. Went back 10 degrees, didn't it? Yep. Isaiah went on to describe shaking heavens and earth, verse 13. He then described the terrors that would befall foreigners living in Babylon. Carrie? I'm reading uh, Isaiah chapter 13, verse 16. While they look on helplessly, their babies will be battered to death, their houses will be looted, and their wives will be raped. Mm. Good news, Bible. It doesn't sound like good news. No, not really. <laughs> he then described the fact that the Medes, and as we will later discover, the Persians, joining them, would attack Babylon and destroy it without causing any damage to the city. But that would be the beginning of a decline for the city of Babylon to the point where... Gary? No one will ever live there again. That's Isaiah 13, 20 from the Good News Bible. Wow. So is that still true? Uh, pretty much when yes. you think about it, yeah. What was it that uh, the talk was that uh, King Hassan was... King Hussein was determined to rebuild right. Babylon. And he started. He actually tried to reconstruct some things and then he was... Gone. He lost. He, was, he, just, uh, he just was killed. So we have seen that Isaiah 13 begins a new section in this book, primarily focusing on judgments against various nations. So, and a lot of that we're going to jump over, because we only have so much time to talk about the whole book of Isaiah. Knowing what we know about history, one would expect that Isaiah would begin his discussions of powerful nations by talking about Assyria. However, he had already spelled out God's words against Assyria in Isaiah 10, 5 through 34. And that passage we are told, and I'm just, we're just going to pick out a couple uh, short snippets from there. Charles? Isaiah 10, 17. God, the light of Israel, will become a fire. Israel's holy God will become a flame, which in a single day will burn up everything, even the thorns and thistles. Good news, Bible. Okay. Way back before this, do we know a story about Nineveh? Earlier in the Bible? Yes, the repentance or? Jonah. Because I Jonah, know. yeah. Yes. That was, what, uh, 150 years earlier in the story of Assyria. But Jonah himself needed a little repentance. Huh? Yes, he did. <laughs> then he went on to describe the fact that while Judah would suffer a lot of problems, they would survive while other nations around them would be completely destroyed. After speaking about the downfall of Assyria, Isaiah discussed the fact that Judah would be taken captive to Babylon, but eventually a few would come back. What do we know about Babylon? Endowed, and I'm quoting now, endowed with a rich and ancient culture, religious and political legacy, Babylon later emerged as a superpower that conquered and exiled Judah. But from the human perspective, of Isaiah's time, it would not have been readily apparent that Babylon would threaten God's people. During much of Isaiah's ministry, Assyria dominated Babylon. From 728 B.C., when Tiglath-Pileser III took Babylon and was proclaimed king of Babylon under the throne named Pulu, or Pul, see 2 Corinthians 15, 19, and 1 Chronicles 5, 26, Assyrian kings retook Babylon several times. 710 B.C., 702 B.C., 689 B.C., 648 B.C., every decade or two, bang, they would come back and conquer Babylon again. Babylon, however, eventually would become the great superpower in the region, the power that would destroy the Judean kingdom, from our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Sunday, January 31. And many places in our lesson for this week, the language speaks of God in his anger, reaching out and destroying nations and peoples. 
Could a God of love actually do that? We need to remember that the God of the Old Testament was? Jesus. Jesus. Let's just look at those verses, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 4. I want you to remember, my brothers and sisters, what happened to our ancestors who followed Moses. They were all under the protection of the cloud and all passed safely through the Red Sea. In the cloud and in the sea, they were all baptized as followers of Moses. All ate the same spiritual bread and drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that went with them, and that rock was? Jesus himself. Christ himself. Absolutely. But that's not the only place. John 5, 39 says, You study the scriptures because you think that in them you will find eternal life. And these very scriptures, and which scriptures is he talking about? Old Testament. There were no New Testament scriptures in those days. The only scripture they had was the Old Testament. These very scriptures speak about me. And then in Luke 24, 44, then he said to them, These are the very things that I told you about while I was still with you. Everything written about me. Now this is Jesus speaking to, those, to his disciples after that walk to Emmaus back in the Jerusalem in the upper room when he, he came in and all of a sudden there he was. Everything written about me and the law of Moses, the writings of the prophets and the Psalms had to come true. So those three categories, those are the three sections of the Old Testament in the Hebrew Bible. So there's no, he says the entire Old Testament is about who? About Jesus Christ. About Jesus Christ. So let us rephrase our question. Would Jesus actually destroy nations? No. Does this say some, anything to us about sin and its results? What is the relationship between sin and God's wrath or anger? Well, we need to remember that God's wrath, this is in the biblical definition, not the way maybe your pastor says or somebody else, some other commentator says, but in the biblical definition, God's wrath is simply his turning away in loving disappointment from those who do not want him anyway, thus leaving them to the inevitable and awful consequences of their own rebellious choices. Leaving them. When God gets angry, quote, unquote, in the biblical sense, what does he do? He unfortunately, he weeps as he steps back and say, well, if that's what you want for yourself, that's, maybe, what, that's maybe, what you get. Maybe we'll have a little time to discussion here. Um, his patience, perhaps, is the word. Um, Long-suffering uh, with different people. Um, he knew uh, Mary Magdalene, out of whom he seven Cast demons. Seven okay? demons, yeah. And it says, uh, no one is... Uh, uh, blaming you, neither do I. But he says, go sin no more. Uh, mm -hmm. She probably did. Uh, we don't yeah. know, but yeah. she did have a problem, and uh, even the disciples would not accept her. Um, but look at what had happened. Yeah. You know, so, and with others, finally the Lord's spirit was taken away from Saul. Mm hmm. Okay, and he died, tried all kinds of crazy things, going to the spirit of Endur. Um, and then we read uh, the, the wheat and the tares growing together mm -hmm. till the end of time. Um, that kind of poses a problem. <laughs> yeah. You know, what do you do in schools, for example, Adventist schools? What do you do in churches? Yeah. Um, no ready-made answer, by the way, not at least I cannot think of. But there is a problem, though. Well, let, let's, let's see if we can work our way through that really? a little bit here. While it is true, and I hope every one of you out there recognizes this, that God has ultimate control over everything. I mean, obviously, he could wipe out the whole earth in an instant if he chose to do so. He has that ability. But that's not his character. No, I didn't say he did that. No, I'm just saying he has the ability to. So he has, he's controls everything in the entire universe. He does not have control over our rebellious choices. Why not? Because he has given us that power of choice. He chooses, he chooses not, not to, to interfere with our freedom. Uh, that, well, because we've, we've mentioned many times, if he takes away our freedom, then we have no ability to love, and God's yeah. 
God's government is built on love. So he does not have control of our rebellion, or he chooses not to control our rebellious choices. And that's, that's the one area which he says, I, I'm, I'm not going to do that. That can only apply not only to individuals, but also to entire nations. So if God allows a nation to suffer the consequences of its collective rebellious choices, does that make God responsible for their deaths or defeat? He's able to respond, but how does he respond? Yeah. How do you, how do you, fit, in, how do you fit into this? I've wondered about this for years as against what the Nazis did to the Jews. Now, if you go into Russia today, there's Jews dying like flies. They're living in little houses. They get next to no pension. Some of their houses, some dogs live in better. Mm -hmm. In other words, they're still suffering, or is that just because of some of the earlier stuff and uh, they just happen to be some of the generations since? There are people suffering from the consequences of other people's sins. Yeah. We've already mentioned the fact that Babylon did not amount to much from the days of Abraham until 648 B.C. Now, there was a, a first Babylonian kingdom back in the days of Abraham. We don't know very much about that. We just know it was there. But what do we know about the history of Babylon after that date, after that 648 BC? In 626 BC, the, Chalde Chaldean, the Chaldean Nabopolassar restored Babylon's gl Babylonian glory by making himself king in Babylon, beginning the Neo-Babylonian dynasty and participating with media in the defeat of Assyria. His son, Nebuchadnezzar II, was the king who conquered and exiled Judah. How did the city of Babylon finally end? Well, uh, 529? 539. 539, correct. And, and what happened? Remember yeah, that Cyrus, Cyrus figured that, that neat yeah. way. They, the river, of the, the uh, Euphrates River runs right through the old city of Babylon. And so they had these big high walls, maybe 17 feet thick or something like that, and 50 feet high around the city, and they just laughed at any enemy. They said, no, nobody can get in here. Well, what happened was... They didn't leave a century. Yeah. <laughs> Cyrus, <laughs> Cyrus said, okay, we can divert this, this river for a short time. So they dig a big hole over there, and but left a wall there at the edge of the river, and they said, okay, now's the time. They broke that little dam there and the water diverted into this pond. The, the, river, the level of the river dropped down and they marched right under those iron gates which were hanging down into the water, marched right under those gates and inside the city and the, the, the places where the boats pulled up to the docks and so forth and there was a gate into the city, they thought nobody can get in here so they didn't even bother to lock those doors. They so just, those, those iron gates really didn't go all the way down to the ground? No, they didn't go all the way down. Uh -huh. They went down into the river, into about the river, two or three right. feet, and right. they figured nobody's going to get underneath there, <laughs> so they thought they would never have to worry about that. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, um, in 539 B.C., that's what we've been talking about, when Cyrus the Persian captured Babylon for the Medo-Persian Empire, the city lost its independence forever. In 482 B.C., Xerxes I brutally suppressed a revolt of Babylonian, Babylon against Persian rule. Now, he, was he the husband of Esther? No, he, that was Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes. Uh, so. He was a grandson, I think, of Xerxes. And uh, what, another quick question. 626, 505, 605? Oh, you're talking about the time... The 2300 days. Uh, okay. The 2300 days begins with 457. That's in the time of Ezra. That's still. No, but six or five, we. Well, six or five was the first conquest of Judah, when Babel, when Daniel and his three companions were taken to Babylon. But when we look at the uh, great uh, uh, Daniel chapter two, the yes. vision. Uh, okay. Uh, no, it's not the vision; it's the dream. Yes. Okay, and so the king. It starts of, with Babylon and the six, Medo Persia. That's from six or five, though. So six or five. Not yeah. six twenty-six. That's the way I'm asking. Oh, no, 626 here is talking about, uh, where is that 626? Your, that's uh, that's Nabopolassar, that's not Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, that's, 626 is, is Nebuchadnezzar's father. But it's still the kingdom oh, yeah. of Babylon. 
Babylon started in yeah yeah but the 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 the, the prophecy the 605 was when the first time that Babylon conquered Judah not the time when Nab when when okay. Babylon became a kingdom it wasn't until later 20 years later more or less that it conquered Judah for the first time so we start counting from there yes okay. yeah okay so moving on here, uh, so Xerxes I brutally suppressed a revolt of Babylon against Persian rule. He removed the statue of Marduk, the chief god, and apparently damaged some fortifications and temples. Alexander the Great took Babylon from the Persians in 331 BC without a fight. <laughs> in spite of his short-lived dream to make Babylon his eastern capital, the city declined over several centuries. By AD 198, this is the time of the Romans now, the Roman Septimus Severus found Babylon completely deserted. So the great city came to an end through abandonment. Today, some Iraqi villages live on parts of the ancient site, but they have not rebuilt the city as such. And that's our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide from Monday, February 1. And why did they live there on that ancient site? Can you guess? Why do a few Iraqis live at the ancient site? Even to this day, they do. Um, Selling trinkets to the tourists. Oh, you've been there, I bet. No, I have not. That's one place I wanted. I, I planned to go one time, and then there was all of a sudden a huge uh, uh, falder all about, about that time, a whole bunch of wars and stuff going on, so I had to cancel. Okay, Isaiah 14. I'm sorry, Cyrus, the king of Medo Persia, finally allowed the children of Israel to return their home in Judah. We read about that in Isaiah 14, 1 to 3. The Lord will once... Is that me? Or is it I think here? it's you. Yeah, Jim. Okay. The Lord will once again be merciful to his people Israel and choose them as his own. He will let them live in their own land again, and foreigners will come and live there with them. Many nations will help the people of Israel to return to the land which the Lord gave them, and there the nations will serve Israel as slaves. Those who once captured Israel will now be captured by Israel, and the people of Israel will rule over those who once oppressed them. The Lord will give the people of Israel relief from their pain and suffering, and from the hard work they were forced to do. Good News Bible. In several places in these chapters, we notice that the terrible judgments that fall on some of these nations are referred to as the day of the Lord. For example, Isaiah 13, 6 and 9. What is that? More than that, God's anger is so powerful that it affects the stars, the sun, the moon, heavens, and earth. Isaiah 13, 10 and 13. Even in our day, terrible disasters are referred to as, Jim, you're in the legal profession? Day, day of the Lord, or, or uh, what do you acts call it? Acts of God. Of God. Yeah. Yeah. You've got insurance policies. Insurance which policy, except... the acts of God. Right in the middle of chapter 14 of Isaiah, we read <clears throat> these incredible words. Carrie, I think that's you. No, we've run off the rails. I'll do it. Okay. <laughs> uh, King of Babylonia, bright morning star, you have fallen from heaven. Wait a minute. Let me just... Yeah, okay. In past you conquered nations, but now you have been thrown to the ground. You were determined to climb up to heaven and to place your throne above the highest stars. You thought you would sit like a king on that mountain in the north where the gods assemble. You said you would climb to the tops of the clouds and be like the Almighty. But instead, you have been brought down to the deepest part of the world of the dead. And that's from Good News Bible. Wow. Mm. There are several places in the Bible where it suggests that God comes out and even shakes the earth pours down rain and conquers his enemies. For example, see the experience of Deborah and Barak as recorded in Judges 5. And I think that's mine. Uh, we, yes. Uh, Carrie says we got off rails here. I'll go ahead and do that. Judges 5, verse 4 and verses 20 through 21. Lord, when you left the mountains of Seir, when you came out of the region of Edom, the earth shook and rain fell from the sky. Yes, water poured down from the clouds. The stars fought from the sky, and they moved across the sky. They fought against Sisera. What happened to Sisera? He died in a, in a little tent. Uh, the, one of the what ladies the, put a 
peg into his ear. The lady drove a peg right through his head, didn't oh, she? That's right. A flood in the Kishon swept them away, the onrushing river Kishon. I shall march, march on with strength. Good news Bible. So that's described as the act of God, but it wasn't really God who did it. It was the lady who did it, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Someone living in Isaiah's day and reading what we wrote, what he wrote in Isaiah 13, 19 through 22, would probably have thought Isaiah had lost his mind. It would, say, it would have seemed impossible. Babylon had been a powerful nation back in the days of Abraham, but then it declined and declined and declined, and even more until nobody thought it was a much account. So this Babylon is same Nimrod, the great grandson yes. of Noah. Yes. Built, so. Yep. Yep. So in response to Babylon's ultimate fate, God gave a clear taunt against its proud king. So God concluded by, and that's Isaiah 14, 3 to 9, and then he concludes, Isaiah 14, 23, Jim. Yeah. I will turn Babylon into a marsh, and owls will live there. I will sweep Babylon with a broom that will sweep everything away. I, the Lord Almighty, have spoken. I should have brought my pictures I have of the ruins of Babylon. There's not much there. It's basically a pile of mud. To understand more about the kings of Babylon, we need to turn to the book of Daniel, if you can remember that. Daniel 3 through 5. What happens in Daniel 3? The, um, they're, they're thrown in the lion's den, I think. No. No, in the fire. Daniel 3, there was, it was the golden statue out on the plain of Dura, and the three young men refused to bow down, got That's thrown. True. No, that's the, number two, two, is, two is, the, is the dream. Is the dream. Okay, yeah. third one. Is and Daniel 4? Four? 4 is Nebuchadnezzar uh, writing the chapter. And he acknowledging the God of heaven. And then chapter 5? He forgets that very quickly. Chapter 5 and 6, um, they're connected. Oh, the, mm. Uh, I don't know. Do we need to look at that? We've talked about three. We've talked about four. Daniel's three friends are sentenced to death. Da 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 da. That's in three. Nebuchadnezzar's second dream of the great tree. That's chapter four. Oh. And chapter five is. Da well, here's Daniel explains the dream, and it all happens. He went and mental. He went mental. Eating grass. Belshazzar's banquet. Aha, uh -huh. okay. right, right. So okay. chapter 7 really should be before 5 and 6. Because, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay, so we have Nebuchadnezzar twice, 3 and 4, and now Belshazzar in verse 5. And they all, if you listen to Nebuchadnezzar in those first two dreams and then Belshazzar at the end, did they uh, seem very humble and quiet? And No. <laughs> No, even the queen came into the banquet, mm -hmm. and then the ha handwriting on the wall, oh, mina mina. These guys thing. were so, they had the ultimate self-esteem and bragging and so forth. Mm -hmm. Not even, is not this great Babylon that I have built, mm -hmm. remember? But not even Nebuchadnezzar would have claimed any direct connection with the gods. Mm. This was dramatically demonstrated every year on the fifth day of the Babylonian Babylonian New Year festival in which the king was required to remove his royal exindic, his royal insignia, before approaching the statue of Marduk so his kingship could be reaffirmed. The idea of displacing even a lesser god would have been looked upon as crazy and suicidal. That comes from the Tuesday Adult Sabbath School Study Guide. Okay. Every two. The proud statements about the king of Babylon should be placed in parallel with another statement about the king of Tyre, as written in Ezekiel 28. Charles? Yeah. Ezekiel 28, 12 through 18. Mortal man, he said, grieve for the fate that is waiting for the king of Tyre. Tell him what I, the sovereign Lord, am saying. You were once an example of perfection. How wise and handsome were you were. You lived in Eden and Garden of God and wore gems of every kind, rubies and diamonds, topaz, beryl, 
carnelian and jasper, sapphires, emeralds and garnets. You had ornaments of gold. They were made for you on the day you were created. I put you terrifying, I put a terrifying angel there to guard you. You lived on my holy mountain and walked among these sparkling gems. Your conduct was perfect from the day you were created until you began to do evil. You were busy buying and selling and this led you to violence and sin. So I forced you to leave my holy mountain and the angel who guarded you drove you away from the sparkling gems. Now I'm going to interrupt for there, for there for a second. You can see here that he's mixing the picture of the priest, the, the, the king of Tyre, yes. with the picture of Lucifer. Lucifer in heaven. So the buying and selling, that was Tyre. Right. But all this other stuff was, of course, Lucifer. You were proud of being handsome, and your fame made you act like a fool. Because of this, I hurled you to the ground and let you as a wandering, what? warning to other kings. You did such evil in buying and selling that your places of worship were corrupted. This is probably Sidon now, Tyre's king yeah. of Tyre. Mm -hmm. Right. So I set fire to the sea and burned it to the ground. All who look at you now see you reduced to ashes. Good this Bible. And that's what happened to the city of Tyre. And we're going to find out later who else ended up being thrown into the lake of fire. Satan. Lucifer himself, right? Yes. For any human being to have made these kinds of boasts or for God to state such things about any mere human being would have been impossible. Clearly, both of these individuals, the one in Isaiah 14 and the one in Ezekiel 28, are representative of the person who stood behind them, Satan himself. And while both Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 talk about the final demise of this Satan, what do we know about his final demise? Revelation 20, verse 10. Then the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had already been thrown and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And of course, we would need to go and read that in the context of, of the Bible, what that means. Isaiah 12, Ezekiel 28. Isaiah 14. 14 right. Isaiah 14. Ezekiel 28 and Revelation chapter 12. Yes. All this to all about to remember all about Satan. And 12 and 13 in 13. Revelation. Oh, yes. So those of us who have studied the great controversy in some detail recognize the absolute contrast between the character of God and the character of Satan. Notice just a few places where the Bible describes God's behavior. Carrie? Uh, still. John, uh, John 13, 5. Then he poured some water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and dry them with the towel around his waist. Philippians 2, 5 to 8. And this is God doing yes. that. Yeah. And no one, none of his disciples would do it. Oh. The attitude you should have is the one that Christ Jesus had. He always had the nature of God, but he did not think that by force he should try to remain equal with God. Instead of this, of his own free will, he gave up all he had and took the nature of a servant. He became like a human being and appeared in human likeness. He was humble and walked the path of obedience all the way to death, his death on the cross. Isaiah, we, pre, 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 part of that uh, passage there, he says, let this mind be in you as it is in Christ Jesus. In other words, be, learn to be like Jesus. Yeah. The, but this is the very man whom Paul hated. Yeah. He hated him. But he, he probably hated No, he, Paul didn't hate him. Saul, Saul hated did. Him. Yes, I take it back. Yeah. But Saul hated. Well, yeah. but there again, he was, he, it took time for him to, he yeah. was being educated. He went to Arabia, just like yeah. Moses did. And, and he was there yeah. for some time. He didn't just right. go through a quick Bible study course no. and, then, and then go out and start preaching. He saw no. Christ in his real beauty, perhaps in Arabia. 
Yeah. And look at Colossians. Thy throne of God is forever and ever. How yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Isaiah's book was written about 700 years before Christ. The book of Revelation was written about 100 years after Christ. So this gives us a span of 800 years. But notice the very interesting parallels between Isaiah 14, 12 to 14, and Revelation 12, 1 to 9, 1 to 9. and we're going to have to let you do that at home because we don't have time. But you will notice some very interesting parallels between John's description of the devil and Isaiah 14. And the Revelation passage, the dragon, sounds very much like the king of Babylon described in Isaiah. One of the puzzling things that has confused some Bible scholars is the fact that John talked about Babylon, and Peter did as well, as if they were a current entity in, in their days. I'm reading from 1 Peter 5.13. Your sister church in Babylon, and it's got a footnote here about Babylon, as in the book of Revelation, this probably refers to Rome, also chosen by God, sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. From the now, we, news what, Bible. what do we know about where Paul, I mean, where Peter ended up his life? In Rome. Rome. Um, he was in that Mamertine prison in Rome, and there he was, he was he, at that point he spoke his gospel to Mark, and Mark wrote it down. So we call it the Gospel of Mark, but it's really Peter's gospel. So we know almost for certainly, certain that in those last days of his life, he was in Rome. Oh. And so that's what the, the people called, yeah. the Christians the called Christians that Babylon. Called. Moving on. It wasn't, it wasn't a good idea to speak against Rome, <laughs> <laughs> calling it Rome. <laughs> yeah. But perfectly fit though. Moving on, Revelation 14 to 8. A second angel followed the first one, saying, She has fallen, great Babylon has fallen. She made all peoples drink of her wine, the strong wine of her immoral lust. Again, Good News Bible. Continuing, Revelation 18, verse 2, 10, and 21. He cried out in a loud voice, She has fallen, great Babylon has fallen. She is now haunted by demons and unclean spirits. All kinds of filthy and hateful birds live in her. They stand a long way off because they are afraid of sharing in her suffering. They say, how terrible, how awful, this great and mighty city Babylon, in just one hour you have been punished. And a mighty angel picked up a stone the size of a large millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, This is how the great city Babylon will be violently thrown down and will never be seen again. Good News Bible. It is clear that like literal Babylon in Daniel's day, Rome and the Babylon of Revelation are proud, ruthless powers that oppressed and destroyed many of God's people. Revelation 17, 6 actually describes this Roman power as being, quote, drunk with the blood of the saints, close quote. These entities are or have been in open rebellion against God. In Babylonian language, the name is bab Eli, which means the gate of God, gods, referring to the uh, place of access to the divine realm, Compare Genesis 11, where people built the Tower of Babel, Babylon, so that by their own power they could rise to the divine level of immunity from the accountability of God to God. When Jacob awoke from a dream, which he saw in a ladder, saw a ladder connecting heaven and earth, he exclaimed, this is none other than the house of God. This is the gate to heaven. Genesis 28, 17. Notice that the house of God is the gate of heaven. That is the way of access to the divine realm. Jacob named the place Bethel, which means the house of God. Okay, let's look at those two contrasts. Babylon calls itself the place uh, the gate of heaven or the gate the, the gate of gods and and why was that what did they believe as you climbed up those ziggurats you could ascend yeah. to, to, the god. God. to god to god yeah they were trying to build a way from human way up to god and jacob what did he see he saw a ladder 
Where did the ladder come from? From heaven. It came down from heaven. And what did he call it? Bethlehem. The house of God or the gate of heaven. And so later he called the name of that place Bethel, which means the house of God. And what was the point of all that? The gate of heaven and Bethel, the gate of God, God's at Babylon were opposite ways to reach the divine realm. Jacob's ladder originated in heaven, revealed from above by God. But Babylon, with its towers and ziggurat temples, was built by human beings from the ground up. These opposite ways represent contrasting paths to salvation, divinely initiated grace versus human works. All true religion is based on the humble Bethel model. For by grace you have been saved through faith, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. All false religion, including legalism and secular humanism, is based on the proud Babylonian model. For the contrast between the two approaches, see Jesus' parallel of the Pharisees and uh, publican. Luke 18, 9 to 14. And you remember that story, those two men who went down to pray near the temple. Near the temple. One was looking up, the, the Pharisee. The Pharisee looked, oh, I'm so thankful that I'm yeah. like, like this, this mm -hmm. publican over here, da, da, da. And what did, the, what did the publican pray? Lord, be merciful to me, a, a sinner. sinner. And who went home justified? He did. He did, yes. The publican. Well, we're going to now jump over and take a short look at Isaiah 24 through 27. The intervening chapters are a list of curses against the pagan and idolatrous nations in the Middle East in Isaiah's day, most of whom disappeared into history. So look at Isaiah 24 if you get a chance, but we'll just touch a couple of points. Isaiah 24, 6 first. So God has pronounced a curse on the earth. Its people are paying for what they have done, Fewer and fewer remain alive. And Isaiah concluded with Isaiah 24, 21 to 23. A time is coming when the Lord will punish the powers above and the rulers of the earth. God will crowd, king, will crowd kings together like prisoners in a pit. He will shut them in prison until the time of their punishment comes. The moon will grow dark. The sun will no longer shine. For the Lord Almighty will be the king, will be king. He will rule in Jerusalem on Mount Zion, and the leaders of the people will see his glory. That's a, again interesting to notice that how does God prove that he's the one in charge? He produces results in the heavens, right? Nothing, there's no way any human could have any impact on that. Well, then turning to the next chapter, Isaiah 25, we find a hymn of praise for the fact that God protected his people. Gary? Okay. You, uh, Isaiah 25, 3 to 5? 3 to 5, yeah. I'm just going to make sure we're, we're off the rails. I'll do it. It's, it's all right. The people of powerful nations will praise you. You will be feared in the cities of cruel nations. The poor and the helpless have fled to you and have been safe in times of trouble. You give them shelter from storms and shade from the burning heat. Cruel enemies attack like a winter storm, like drought in a dry land. But you, Lord, have silenced our enemies. You silence the shouts of cruel people as a cloud cools a hot day. And that's from the Good News Bible. So God prepares a banquet for those who remain faithful to him while he punishes those who have been his enemies, the enemies of his people. Notice we put punishes there in quotes. And finally in Isaiah 26, God will give his people victory. Isaiah concluded by saying, and now I think this is the one that was supposed to be yours, Carrie. Uh, I'll just... Or was that Charles? I'm sorry. Okay, I can do it. That's fine. Okay. Uh, Isaiah 26, 20, and 21. Go into your houses, my people, and shut the door behind you. Hide yourselves for a little while until God's anger is over. The Lord is coming from his heavenly dwelling place to punish the people on earth for their sins. The murderers, 
murders that were secret, secretly committed on earth will be revealed and the ground will no longer hide those who have been killed. Good news Bible. I, okay, yeah. Isaiah 27, 79. Israel has not been punished by the Lord as severely as its enemies, nor lost as many people. The Lord punished his people by sending them into exile. He took them away with a cruel wind from the east. But Israel's sins will be forgiven only when the stones of pagan altars are ground up like chalk and no more incense altars or symbols of goddess Ashtoreth are left. Goodness okay, God. now let's think about this for a moment. We've already seen that what happened with the children of Israel? Who conquered them? Uh, the children of Judah, actually the kingdom of Judah. Who, was con who conquered the Babylon. kingdom of Judah? Babylon. Babylon. And they came in a sort of an ordinary, it looked like an ordinary human way, and they conquered the city, and they took the people they wanted, and they did it three times, didn't they? Yeah. So why is God claiming that he's the one that's doing this? He allowed? Yep. God is accused of doing that which he does not prevent and that which he allows. Yep. And the, and the ancients... Whatever's happened is God's God's doing it, you know. Even God, to this day. Oh yeah, yeah, very much so. Act of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of what I I've st been studying, I'll send you a, a copy of it. But uh, most of these killings that are attributed to God are in the historical books. They're not in the prophets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. But now notice, but Israel's sins will be forgiven only when the stones of pagan altars are ground up yes. like chalk. And no more incense altars or symbols of the goddess Asher are left. So how does that fit in? <laughs> what is God saying here? Uh, there's a condition. Okay. Well, so, they're worshiping well, pa these pagan yeah, deities. Yeah. And so what's yeah. God to do? If, so if, what? Run off God, God says, okay, if, this is, if these are the gods you're going to depend upon, depend upon them. See what happens. Well, Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 25 and 26. I like the translation when it says, I gave them over to laws by which they could not have life. Yeah. A couple of popular translations, though, says, I gave them laws by which they could not have life. That's a bad translation. But you got, in fact, uh, in, in the... Uh, <laughs> New International Version says it one way, one time, and it, that is in 1984, and then 2011, they, they change it the other way. So it's, you, you got to learn how to read the Bible with some of these passages. They're yeah. just... Uh, so what is the relationship between the fact that Israel was still worshiping pagan gods and God's blessings are curses against it? Well, if, if God continued to bless them and they were doing these things... Are they learning anything useful and worthwhile? No. So in our study for this week, we have noted that the king of Babylon and the king of Tyre were both described in terms that could only apply to Satan, who is or was actually the power behind them. So, and remember in the New Testament, Peter after, you know, Peter made that wonderful declaration, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, and then Peter, and then Jesus says, well, okay, but this is what's going to happen to me. And Peter says, oh, no, you can't, that can't happen to you. And Jesus said, what? Get thee behind me, Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan. So that's what's happening here. He's speaking through the person or past the person to the power that's, on, that's operating behind it. Now we have seen that the future things that Isaiah prophesied in these chapters will take place only after the thousand years of the millennium described in Revelation 20. Now, Isaiah had no idea about that. He thought everything about the Messiah was going to happen at the first coming. But we know, now that we've been able to see the details spread out, that these things, some of these times that talk up talking about, you know, the perfect city and the Jesus ruling forever, etc., that's going to be at the third coming. Um, just as Babylon fell in ancient times and never amounted to anything since then, all traces of evil will be destroyed, never to return. Isaiah probably thought that these powerful messages about Jerusalem would apply to the Jerusalem of his day. But we now know that they apply to the new Jerusalem. 
One of the biggest questions raised by these passages in Isaiah is the question of whether God really destroys the wicked. And here we have Isaiah 8.21. The Lord will fight as he did at Mount Perizim and in the Valley of Gibeon in order to do what he intends to do. Strange as his actions may seem, he will complete his work, his mysterious work. Now, people like to use that verse every time there's some, that God seems to be doing something that doesn't seem quite right. So let's look at it more carefully. Look at Isaiah 28, 21, where God's work of destruction is his strange deed. This is from our Bible study guide. It is strange for him because he doesn't want to do it, but it is nevertheless a deed or an act. So would God do something that he doesn't want to do? Does that happen? Well, what's going to happen to the third coming? On occasion, All the wicked will perish. Is that something that God wants to have happen? No. 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 It is true that sin carries the seeds of self-destruction. We're going to look at that in a moment. But because God has ultimate power over life and death, and he determines the time, place, and manner of final destruction, Revelation 20, talking about the millennium, it is pointless to argue that he ultimately terminates the curse of sin in a passive way by simply allowing cause and effect to take its natural course. Adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Thursday, February 4. Now, I will be honest with you, I have a problem with that statement. So, could this be a pagan idea expressed in the Teacher's Guide? Does God have to add punishment to sin? Sin pays its wage. Or, the, the wage of... or is the final end of sin and sinners a natural consequence? Well, James 1, 15. Jim? Then, excuse me, their cruel, excuse me, then their evil desires conceive and give birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Romans six twenty three. For sin pays its wage, death. But God's free gift is eternal life in the union with Jesus Christ, excuse me, Christ Jesus our Lord. God destroys no man. This is Every, from Ellen White now. Right. God destroys no man. Everyone who is destroyed will have destroyed himself. Everyone who is stifles the admonitions of conscience is sowing the seeds of unbelief, and these will produce a sure harvest. By rejecting the first warning from God, Pharaoh of old sowed the seeds of obstinacy, and he reaped obstinacy. God did not compel him to disbelieve. The seed of unbelief which he sowed produced a harvest of its kind. Thus his resistance continued until he looked upon his devastated land, upon the cold, dead form of his firstborn, and the firstborn of all in his house, and all the families in his kingdom, until the waters of the sea closed over his horses and his chariots, chariots and his men of war. His history is a fearful illustration of the truth of the words that whatever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Galatians 6, 7. Did men not realize... Not realize. Excuse me. Did men but realize this? They would be careful what seeds they sow. Ellen G. White. Ellen Christ White, Christ, Ob Christ Object Lessons, page 84, paragraph 4. Okay, so how are we going to put all this together? In Isaiah 24 to 27, we see that those who are on God's side will ultimately triumph, <clears throat> while those who are, who are opposed to God will ultimately be destroyed. So how can we protect ourselves? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Back to this early part of this, uh, Romans 6.23, pass, uh, the Ellen White yeah. passage there. Um, <laughs> That, that's that's really quite uh, quite important to, to understand that uh, God uh, you know you set you set yourself away. What you do is you you, you refuse to listen to the spirit of truth. Mm -hmm. That's uh, what, what do they say? It's, it's, Jesus says you could blaspheme Jesus, the, uh, or Jesus. You could blaspheme the Father, but the, the spirit of truth. Yeah. What can you do? You, the, you're no longer receptive to the yeah. words of truth. Yeah. Okay. 
Well, we're coming to a conclusion here now. In Isaiah 24 through 27, we see that those who are on God's side will ultimately triumph, while those who are opposed to God will ultimately be destroyed. And one way to understand that is, who is the source of life? God is the source of life. Only yes. he can give us life. So how can we protect ourselves, Gary? Trust in, uh, I'm reading from Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 7. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Never rely on what you think you know. Remember the Lord in everything you do, and he will show you the right way. Never let yourself think that you are wiser than you are. Simply obey the Lord and refuse to do wrong. From the Good News Bible. Keep Romans 10, 19, go ahead. Okay. 10, 9, I'm sorry. If you confess that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from death, you will be saved. The Good News Amen. Bible. Acts 16, verse 31, they answered, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your family. From so how, yes. how do we prepare ourselves to be on God's side? Many down to the ages have thought this depends on a lot of good works. However, our salvation depends completely on our relationship with Jesus Christ, and we call that faith, and not on any collection of good works that we might do. Sin began in heaven with pride and arrogance in the heart of Lucifer. Why are these, those sins so dangerous? It is primarily because pride feels no need. The proud think they are okay. They do not need to change. But the Bible goes on to say that people of all nations will have an opportunity to be saved. So when, what do we think of when we think about the day of God's judgment? For many people, this is a very scary idea. But in light of our studies this week, in the light of all that we have read in Scripture, we need to remember that God's judgment will not only be a terror for the evildoers, but also a time of salvation for those who do what is right. And this is true throughout the universe. While God gives victory to his children and even prepares a banquet for them, Isaiah 25, those who rebel against him will be punished. See the example of Moab. So it is true that God destroys his enemies? Is it true that God destroys his enemy? Or is it true that God just allows people and angels to reap the results of their own choices, either good or bad? And we are running out of time. We, we realize that God, God, judgment comes by God's initiative. And you can read the rest in your Bible study guide. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for this privilege we've had of studying these passages from Isaiah and learning some very important points. Help us to know how we can best digest them and make them a part of our thinking so that we will not have any wrong ideas about you. Help us to recognize that you are a God of love and all that you do is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you.